This is uh, one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, a million years ago, I actually was a plant pathologist back in the day uh, when I was working in North Carolina for my graduate studies. Uh, and I did a lot of work with disease management of tomatoes in particular. So if you have questions about tomatoes, I can certainly do my best to, uh, to, to, to talk about those uh, and other crops as well. But, you know, one of the things like in this title slide, we can, we can learn a lot from these pictures. So up here in the top left, this is uh, basically the xylem tissue of this tomato stem has been colonized by most likely Fusarium oxysporum is what that looks like to me. Um, and there's a lot of different soil-borne plant pathogens that will actually colonize that xylem tissue, in other words, the plumbing tissue uh, of the plant. And, and so one of the ways we can identify that is if you take a knife and slice open the side of that stem, if you don't see nice, white, healthy xylem, um, then it's likely that there's potentially a pathogen in there. Uh, similarly, this picture in the middle, this is one of uh, a picture of southern blight which is caused by a fungi called Sclerotium rossii. And this is actually fairly common in our area. Uh, this is the time of year that you start seeing it when it gets really hot, because uh, it loves hot weather. Um, and it's also oftentimes quite prevalent on organic farms, and we'll talk about why a little bit later. Uh, this is a one called bacterial wilt over here on the right. And you can see this plant in the background too is totally wilted down. Uh, thankfully, this is not a disease that we have in this part of the country. Uh, there was some fun uh, discussion on the listserv earlier this month about somebody having some tomato problems, um, but this is a, a tremendously devastating disease in the southeastern part of the U.S., and it doesn't survive the winters here, thankfully. Um, but in that case, it's actually a bacteria uh, that will live in the xylem tissue of the plant as well, and it will basically flip a switch like that and cause total wilting of the plant and that total collapse. Uh, and there's not very many pathogens that will actually cause a symptom where you just totally wilt the plant, it's all green tissue like that. So as plant pathologists, we sort of try and do our best to, to piece together uh, these what we call signs and symptoms, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, in order to make a, a diagnosis for a particular uh, pathogen or disease. So in terms of what are we going to talk about today, um, I thought it would be good to go through a little bit of basic uh, biology about plant pathogens in terms of fungi, bacteria, viruses, what they are and how they work. Um, and then also, you know, I think it's important to, um, especially as part of this overall workshop, to include some information about diagnosis and how do we actually identify problems out in the field uh, as being potentially caused by biotic stressors like pests and, and diseases uh, or pathogens, I should say. Um, or is it caused by something abiotic like heat stress or nutrient stress or something like that? Uh, and then we'll get more into the nuts and bolts of, you know, some of the diseases that we see and, and in particular some management practices that we can use in organic cropping systems for specialty crops. So if you <clears throat> learn one thing from this uh, presentation today, I think it's really important to remember uh, that when we talk, oftentimes we talk about pathogens and we talk about disease like they're the same thing. Uh, but in fact, they're not the same thing. And it's important to recognize that when we try and manage diseases or minimize uh, disease outbreaks. So pathogens are the causal agent, right? The bacteria, the fungi, the virus, the nematode uh, that actually causes the disease. Um, but the disease is the physical expression of the host, the environment, and the pathogen really together, right? So you have to have a susceptible host in order to see any level of disease. And we're going to talk about um, host resistance here in a little while and some of the different mechanisms that are used. But without, you know, if your biggest problem is late blight of tomatoes, the easiest way to get rid of that disease is don't grow tomatoes, right? Um, and I know that's kind of a, a silly thing to say, but at the same time, it's very true. So, you know, <clears throat> disease doesn't occur without a susceptible host. And then lastly, uh, the third, you know, side of what we call the plant disease triangle is environment. Uh, and all pathogens require a suitable environment in order to, you know, grow, colonize the plant and cause the expression of symptoms and, and disease uh, within, the, within the plant. So, one of the things that we can do is we can tug on these different strings and we can affect uh, 
the environment, we can infect the we can affect the host, and we can affect the pathogen in order to minimize or reduce the amount of diseases. If we think about conventional cropping systems where we use a lot of fungicides, you know, most of those systems, they're working more or less against the pathogen, right? Because they're trying to use fungicides to just kill the population of the pathogen. Uh, but then maybe if we're looking for more in integrated strategies or organic strategies, uh, like organic growers, for example, grow a lot in high tunnels, right? Because if you reduce the amount of rain uh, or really the, the leaf wetness period on on plants, then you're gonna have a lot less disease. So there's lots of different ways that we can tweak that triangle in order to manage diseases. So how do plant pathogens live uh, in the agro ecosystem? So really in all kinds of ways, right? And we could spend an entire hour just talking about this alone, but by and large, when, we, when we're talking about plant pathogens, we're talking about bacteria, fungi, nematodes, and viruses. And if you look at this picture on the right, this is basically the head of a plant pathogenic nematode. Uh, nematodes are submicroscopic worms that live in water films, essentially, in the soil. Uh, and then and there are foliar nematodes as well that live on the leaves of plants. Uh, now, there's tons of beneficial or mutualistic nematodes out there. Um, but then there's, there's also a small set um, that are pathogenic against plants. And the way we know that is because they have this stylet here that basically they use to inject into plant cells uh, and essentially suck all the delicious good stuff out of those cells uh, in order to complete their life cycle. So those are by far the largest organisms that are attacking plants. Uh, but then fungi, of course, I mean, I think many people are familiar with, with them. Um, and then we look all the way down to, so this would be like a bacteria down here in the bottom right, uh, excuse me, the bottom left. Um, and then uh, viruses are, of course, the smallest ones. Now, <clears throat> um, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that plant pathogens, and in the same way that insects as well, uh, is where they live out in the, the, the landscape, right? So they can survive on perennial plants. Oftentimes weeds are alternative hosts for both diseases and insects. And so one of the, you know, as, as much as we like to ignore the weeds in the ditches out around the fields, um, the reality is it is, you know, very useful to keep a lot of those areas well manicured because those are oftentimes hosts for insects uh, and for pathogens as well too. And there's been a lot of documented examples of those where if you can, especially like with viruses, um, you can manage the weeds that are outside in the fields. Oftentimes it disrupts the life cycle uh, and of the vectors that are bringing them onto the crop plants. So this is just sort of a, a what we call a disease cycle of, of, of various different um, pathogens here. And you can see basically how, uh, sorry, this isn't a disease cycle. This is just an example of how pathogens might live out in the environment uh, and how they survive. So Oftentimes, um, fungi and bacteria will, will be in the soil, um, you know, as cellular organisms, but most of them will have some type of overwintering structure, and especially fungi in particular, um, for, that they go through in their life cycles. So um, they can be what we call macrospores, which are basically hardened uh, spore uh, cells, but then also we see sclerotia pretty often, um, or microsclerotia in the case of verticillium. Um, they often will survive in plant residues, and that's why uh, that sanitation thing that Mark was talking about earlier is so important is because if, if we're getting the infected plant materials out of the production system, it's going to help keep it cleaner. Um, they can also come in through insects, and especially viruses are almost all viruses for plant, for plant diseases or that cause plant diseases are spread by insects. So maybe the one uh, example that is not would be tobacco mosaic virus. Um, but for the most part, they're not really spread by people and mechanical touching, they're, they're spread by insects. So if you can manage the insects that are spreading them, um, that can be a really useful practice. So in the world of plant pathology, we have what we call signs and symptoms of plant diseases. Okay, so the signs are when you actually see physical evidence of the pathogen. So that can be uh, the sclerotia, it can be mycelium, mushrooms, uh, where you, you know, in the case of bacteria, they might ooze out of cankers. 
right? And so you can actually see physical evidence of the pathogen. Now, that's not typical for like viruses, right? You, you can never see a virus, but um, by and large for bacteria and fungi, uh, that would be what you're looking at. Symptoms are really the expression of the disease within the host, right? So uh, lots of plant diseases cause chlorosis and necrosis. And chlorosis is basically yellowing of the leaves. Uh, and ne necrosis, or when the leaves go necrotic, that's when they die and become brown, right? Um, but we see all kinds of symptoms. Uh, viruses like to cause malformations and mosaics, especially in the growing tissue of the plant, um, because viruses are basically attracted into that meristem uh, through that source sink relationship within the, the phloem. Um, and that actually causes those malformations to grow, usually at the growing tip of the plant. We talked earlier about how some, some pathogens will clog up the plumbing system of the plant, right? So you can have wilts uh, and diebacks. And so, you know, oftentimes our best way to diagnose uh, what the pathogen is that's causing the disease is, is really through the expression of these signs and symptoms. So we typically call that the, the disease signature in plant pathology, if you're curious. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important to remember that you know, the internet is probably one of the most dangerous places uh, to look for information when it comes to plant disease diagnosis. There's a lot of difficulty in taking a look at a picture and knowing if the same thing is happening to your plants as it is in the picture. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we can do is think about how the biology that pathogen causes damage and causes disruptions within the plant's life cycle leading to the expression of symptoms. Um, because oftentimes, just because a, a leaf is yellowing, it's like, well, where is it yellowing within the leaf, right? And is it starting at the bottom and moving towards the top? These are the kinds of things we're looking for. And, and it's oftentimes lost uh, just looking through the internet. So I, my personal opinion is that, especially when it comes to disease diagnosis, uh, it's really good to utilize uh, the plant disease and insect clinic or other folks that work in an extension or you know other growers that have a pretty pretty good experience uh, with disease diagnosis as well too because it can be tricky. Okay so let's talk a little bit about plants as hosts of pathogens right so there's a lots of different things that can happen when a pathogen meets a plant crop right or a host. Um, first of all in many cases and really in 99.9% .9 of all the combinations of microbes and plants, most of the time you have non-host resistance, right? So uh, for whatever reason, the cellular mechanisms of that host don't allow for um, that pathogen to enter and colonize the, the plant tissue. And, you know, the reality is we think of plant pathogens um, <clears throat> as being fairly generalistic, but for the most part, there's actually a very, very tight relationship between pathogens and their hosts. And so, you know, just because you have powdery mildew on tomatoes doesn't mean you're going to have powdery mildew on cu cucumbers because they're two completely different pathogens um, that, that have a, you know, very distinct relationship with their hosts. <clears throat> so in terms of resistance and tolerance, this is where we start to see your uh, continuation or, or spectrum really from susceptible to resistant. So when we think of resistance, that basically, that basically means that the plant has some type of mechanism that it utilizes in order to reduce the ability of that pathogen to cause disease um, or in quantitative resistance, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it stops it completely, but that it reduces the spread of the disease either through the plant or through a population of plants, right? So <clears throat> within resistance, we, we really have two mechanisms that can happen. Um, and oftentimes, you know, so a good example is with bacterial wilt or Ralstonia solanaceum of tomato. Uh, there's a lot of genetics out there that shows fairly good resistance against that pathogen. Uh, and basically what the, the physiologists figured out is that as that bacteria moves through the xylem tissues of those plants, uh, the plant is actually able to build it thickens its cells wall, its cell walls, and it closes some of those internal doors between cells in order to prevent the movement of that bacteria through the xylem tissue and through the plant. 
So it, it literally slows the colonization process. It doesn't stop it altogether. Uh, and in that case, that's what we would call quantitative, re quantitative resistance. And, and the, the reason that we, one of the ways that it's different is because it oftentimes is not completely resistant or completely susceptible. It, it lies on that continuum, right? Um, and, and oftentimes this is controlled by multiple genes within the plant because it's a complex system of sort of um, general uh, mechanisms against the colonization of these plants by those pathogens. And we also have what's called single gene resistance. And the reason I bring this up is because it, it becomes kind of important when you start looking for varieties against certain pathogens or diseases. So in the case of single gene resistance, um, the, the plants have adapted a mechanism whereby one single gene actually controls the ability of the plant to identify that pathogen. And usually it's just like a, a receptor or something that identifies the protein that's coded by the cell wall of the fungi or something. That, that part doesn't really matter. What matters is um, the plant is able to locate essentially that pathogen within the tissue of it, and it causes what we call a hypersensitive response. And what that does is it actually kills its own tissue through programmed cell death and kills all the tissue around where it detects uh, where that pathogen is. And, and typically in the, these defense mechanisms in the plant, those are controlled by single genes. And so the breeders have been able to identify a lot of these individual genes that code for these receptors against certain pathogens, right? And they're able to breed them through different varieties. Now, one of the ways that it's different than multigenic or quantitative resistance is that it applies very heavy selection pressure, or in, in, in many ways you could say evolutionary pressure uh, against this resistance. And so what can happen is you can have races develop, right? So a good example is with Verticillium wilt of tomato. Uh, somebody identified a single gene called the VD gene. Uh, they deployed it back in the 1950s and 60s. And for a few years, everything was gravy because you know growers were planting. They didn't have Verticillium wilt problems. Everybody was super excited about it. Uh, and then after a while, there was, you know, mutations within the verticillium population that allowed them to become resistant to that single gene. And so just within, you know, the period of a decade, those um, individuals within the population were able to reproduce quickly. And suddenly you have now what's called race two of verticillium dahlia because it's able to overcome that resistance. So it's not uncommon to see um, seed companies advertising resistance for certain pathogens where there are races that have developed. Um, so Fusarium is another good example of that. We have now race three. Uh, so you have to find single, you know, important varieties um, in order to overcome that issue. So, you know, if you're dealing with a real severe disease problem and you find out that there are resistant varieties out there, it's good to do a little bit of digging uh, to find out what that means and if that resistance is still effective, because sometimes it's not. Uh, and I will point out that in this case, you know, we're not really talking about GMOs or transgenic crops. We're, you know, these, this, these are basically breeding techniques that were started back in the 1920s um, with wheat, actually. <clears throat> or maybe it was flax. I think it was flax. Anywho, um, and then the last category that we have is plant tolerance. And, and this is actually a pretty common occurrence um, within plants. And, and oftentimes the seed companies kind of use resistance and tolerance as interchangeable words, and they're really not. So plant tolerance is basically uh, when the plant pathogen is able to live, colonize, and reproduce on that host, but it either caused reduced symptoms uh, or no symptoms whatsoever. And so like we see examples of that in tomato with root knot nematodes. Some, there are some varieties out there that aren't resistant. The nematodes can still reproduce and, and grow, um, but they have still very high yields, like they're not being impacted by the nematodes. <clears throat> so in the case of, this is a, just a, an old table that I have uh, looking at tomato in particular and some of these diseases. And I just wanted to point this out. So, 
all these ones that say R and S. And I think in general, when you look at seed catalogs, if they only give you one example, it's either resistant or susceptible, then it's likely that that was a qualitative resistance or a single gene resistance. Whereas if you see them using words like moderately resistant and highly resistant over here, uh, those are typically indicative of quantitative resistance. So let's talk a little bit about soil for a minute. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to do, and, and I think we've, has already been mentioned with this workshop, is ways that we can um, utilize ecosystem services to help manage uh, diseases, insects, example, uh, et cetera, excuse me. And I think one of the best examples for diseases is managing soil. Uh, if we have very sterile soil, um, then we're not going to be able to manage soilborne pathogens as well. And there's been actually a fair amount of research uh, that shows if you go in and fumigate the soil and create sort of a biological vacuum, um, then oftentimes those pathogenic microbes will quickly recolonize uh, those beds and you can have, you know, real issues with plant diseases. So one of the things we want to do, especially in organic systems, is support a very diverse soil community. Uh, and we're not going to talk about all the ways to do that. Um, that's more in the soil health uh, webinar. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to reiterate how important that is. And, and one of the best ways to feed the soil food web is really just by making sure you're always incorporating sources of organic material. Because in many ways, uh, those, that is the primary sort of food source uh, for that soil food web. Now, one of the reasons that we want to do that is because we want to support um, the conservation of some of these beneficial bacteria and fungi and nematodes as well that can live in the soil. So, you know, we talked earlier about how we want to have um, potentially uh, fungi that can, you know, eat other fungi or sometimes actually what we see more likely is fungi that actually eat nematodes and vice versa. Um, but there's also, especially in the world of bacteria, uh, been a fair amount of research done in the world of uh, these rhizosphere bacteria uh, or bacteria that live endophytically within the root system and actually turn on endogenous defense pathways within the plant. So there's two or three of these defense pathways actually there's and we won't get into the details of that um, and they'll actually turn on genes and, and upregulate genes that help code for um, you know uh, products that help against insects, <clears throat> as well as diseases. So these have been documented a number of times, and I'll, I'll show you an example of one later on as well. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk a little bit about disease diagnosis. Um, and this is actually, you know, I think one of the more fun parts of working in the world of plants is just all the problem solving that's involved. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes it can be a little overwhelming to try and figure out what a certain disease or pest problem is in the field. Uh, but one of the easiest ways to actually do that, or I shouldn't say easy, but one of the best ways to do that is really start, first of all, with what it's not, right? Uh, and this is a, a quote actually from my old PhD advisor, Frank Lowe's, and, and this was, he was a, a field pathologist, and he's, well, he's actually now a department head, but uh, he was an excellent extension plant pathologist who could go out into the field and spend all day just like diagnosing diseases and stuff out there. Uh, and I learned a lot from him, but one of the things he always reiterated to me is the first thing you got to do is eliminate what the problem is not, right? Because uh, you, you can't start with these huge laundry lists and, and um, try and identify what it is. So you need to eliminate what, you're, what you know you're not dealing with and discounting the highly improbable. So, you know, I brought up that um, discussion on the listserv earlier. Somebody mentioned, well, maybe your tomato has bacterial wilt. And it's like, well, hold on, guys. Like, it's really improbable that anybody has bacterial wilt in Kansas City. And if they do, then you might need to call APHIS about that. So anyways, um, you know, that's just one approach, but I think it can be pretty helpful. So one of the things we first look at is the spatial distribution. Again, you know, this can be well applied to, to insect identification as well as disease uh, diagnosis too, but how is it being distributed? Are you seeing it across multiple families and species and varieties of crops? You know, we talked earlier about how oftentimes, not all plant pathogens, but most of them are fairly specific uh, to their hosts. So if you're seeing them across multiple different types of hosts, it's, it's pretty unlikely that that's caused by 
a plant pathogen, but it, but it can happen with certain ones like detritus and some others. Uh, topography is a big one, especially with disease diagnosis. We oftentimes uh, see uh, diseases in sort of the low spots uh, where there's a lot of water that has been sitting for a while and allows those zoospores to, to swim around and infect plant roots. Um, so, you know, that's one thing we look at very closely. It's also important too when you start trying to diagnose things like uh, nutrient issues as well as, you know, water stress and things like that. <clears throat> So these are just some visual depictions of some of these different spatial patterns that you might see in the field. Uh, obviously, random things uh, are, are less common, um, but these are probably more indicative of something that's spread by an insect uh, or in the case of leaf diseases uh, or foliar diseases where you have spores blowing around through the air. You might see those randomly. Uh, aggregated patterns are typic typical of diseases that we see that are spread by soilborne plant pathogens. So ones that are limited to small areas of soil will call, cause what we call hot spots in the field. And so that's one of the best ways you can identify the difference between the two if you have a soilborne issue uh, or a foliar issue is, is whether or not you're seeing hot spots in the field or if it's just randomly distributed. Uh, and then obviously, you know, this is probably a broken drip tape here, right? So you know, sometimes that spatial pattern or clue you in on things like abiotic stressors as well. <clears throat> uh, the temporal distribution, when it happened, is oft oftentimes very important. Is it something that happened really quickly? Was it acute, right? Did it happen overnight? Um, typically, diseases are not spread overnight. Um, epidemics happen slowly. Uh, with most diseases in the world of plants. And so if you see things happen overnight, either somebody wasn't scouting well and it happened when we weren't watching, um, or maybe it's not a, necessarily a, a plant pathogen issue. Um, the areas that were affected, what has been going on, this is always important, right? If you start to see a bunch of curling leaves and you've been smelling 2,4-D in the last couple of days, right? You know, it's like uh, just being kind of clued in. And, and these are also questions we ask people as extension folks when we um, go out into the world and, and try and help people diagnose some of the issues they're having. So this is a picture I took in Costa Rica and I just thought this was like the most amazing picture of aggregated spatial distribution. This is, this is caused by nematode damage on coffee um, and they have, nematodes can move, they can swim about one meter per year. So you'll have a hot spot that will slowly grow uh, over time and you'll see the leading edge of the nematodes is actually you know, where you're seeing the most damage. Uh, so here's a picture of nutrient stress of, on cauliflower. I believe this is calcium deficiency, if I remember correctly. Um, and, you know, with nutrient deficiencies, you're going to see it spread across the entire plant or, or population of plants, I should say. Whereas with plant pathogens um, and diseases, uh, you're going to see it in certain spots. Here's another picture of that aggregated spatial pattern. This is called sclerotinia lettuce drop. And we have this, um, this is caused by sclerotinia minor, which is a fungi that lives in the top portion of the soil. And it is fairly prevalent in this part of the country. I see it quite a bit when I'm out visiting farms. Um, it causes a total collapse of the lettuce plant, just wilts down. You can see some of these, these guys right here in the front have just recently collapsed. So that can be another example of an aggregated a, a pathogen that causes aggregated spatial patterns. So when you start trying to sort all this stuff out, you know, just I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the times we, we see problems in the field, they're oftentimes not caused by biotic stressors like pathogens and insects, um, but oftentimes um, by abiotic stressors. And so it's important to recognize how we can kind of work that out. So if something literally happens overnight, um, then, you know, either somebody drove through your field or maybe a freeze or a flood, you know, disease epidemics don't happen overnight. You're, gonna, you're not going to have an entire field that's going to get killed, right? So it's very unlikely that would be the case. Um, and then within chronic problems, one of the ways we can, you know, try and parse those out is just looking at that spatial distribution. So this is just kind of a fun exercise. This was a Actually, my dad's garden patch, many years ago, I took these series of pictures. We were out visiting for the summer um, when I didn't live here. And uh, so these are some bolted lettuce. You can see they're just wilting really, really, really heavy. 
and then I was walking down the row and here's some beets also wilting really badly. Uh, now look in the background, these plants look pretty good here, right? So that's kind of interesting. Um, but we both got lettuce and beets, which are in, in different families um, wilting. So that's not something that's typical of a disease. You also see just how widespread it is. Every single plant in there is wilting, right? Then we walk to the next garden patch and here's his tomatoes and look how badly they're wilting. Uh, and again, this did happen literally overnight, overnight in this case. Uh, and it's very rare that you see diseases actually turn green leaves wilty like this. This is not something you see very often. So in this case, we're actually dealing with flooding. Um, and I'll not, since we're running short on time, I won't go into all the hairy details of that. Um, but keep in mind that when a plant, when the, the groundwater is saturated uh, for long periods of time, there's no oxygen down there. And so the plants aren't able to take up water. Um, and so that causes flooding damage, which really looks just like drought damage. Essentially, it's the same thing. In this case, there was actually sort of, it's hard to tell because of these leaves, uh, but there was sort of like alleyways within the garden. And so any of those low spots in the garden were just heavily flooded uh, and causing all that wilting. Okay, so I mentioned the integrated pest management earlier, um, and just to sort of revisit that, you know, we we always want to be thinking about these factors down here at the bottom, uh, and and using therapeutics as a backup. Uh, now, in the case of organic um, disease management or pest management, those are usually OMRI-approved therapeutics, uh, things like sprays, but there are are other therapeutics we can use as well. <clears throat> now, one of the things I wanted to mention. Uh, in particular is managing soilborne diseases. And I know a lot of folks grow in high tunnels around here and soilborne diseases can be particular, particularly difficult to manage in high tunnels because once you get a contaminated soil, it's very difficult to get rid of that pathogen inoculum, right? And so, you know, I think it's just really important to be cognizant of that issue uh, whenever you're managing, managing diseases on the farm. Um, there are some, well, not some, there's one pathogen that you can literally sample for, which is root knot nematodes. And root knot nematodes are fairly common here in Kansas, in the, in especially places that have sandy soils, uh, like South Central Kansas. Um, but in that case, you can sample in the fall is usually the best time and actually send those into the, the nematology lab on campus and they'll tell you how many you have in your, your soil and if, you're, if you have a threshold that, where you feel like you should do something about that. <clears throat> In terms of the symptoms and signs for soilborne diseases, what you're really looking at are things that enter uh, the plant through the root system or the stem and cause diebacks and chlorosis and necrosis. Now, there are some interesting interactions with soilborne diseases and cover crops as well. And we, I mentioned southern blight earlier. This is a pathogen that loves organic matter. It loves carbon and it loves it in all of its forms. Uh, and so it can be really, problematic in, in farming systems that utilize a lot of cover crops because what it likes to do is just crawl across the top layer of soil, eat all that straw or mulch or whatever, you know, organic matter you just put in through the cover crop and eventually make its way to the tomato or the pepper that's going to cause disease on. The other thing that we found out too is that crimson clover can actually be an alternative host for root knot nematodes. Um, rye is also an alternative host for thrips, which can be a problem if it's spreading viruses, which we don't have too many issues with tomato spotted wilt virus here, but in general, just keep in mind that as great as cover crops are for the soil, they can also complicate things when it comes to disease management as well too. So you, if you're, especially when it comes to Southern blight, if you've seen a lot of issue with that disease, you might um, start thinking about some of your cover cropping strategies and ways you can actually maybe reduce the amount of uh, carbon that you're putting back into the soil. Okay, so let's talk about some more of these actual disease management practices. Uh, first and foremost, you always want to use clean seed. Uh, and for several pathosystems um, within many of the vegetable crops, there are actual certified clean seed um, systems out there where you, you buy things that are certified as clean plants, essentially, when it comes to certain uh, bacterial pathogens, especially in viruses. Um, and I would encourage all of you, you know, especially if you're looking into things that are being propagated vegetatively, like strawberries and sweet potatoes, 
um, to, to look into some of those clean transplant pr programs that are run around the country um, because they are oftentimes very useful. Uh, and, and in general, we wanna support nurseries that are supporting um, those clean transplant programs. There are some, um, <clears throat> some practices that you can utilize to actually uh, disinfest seeds. So especially if you're saving your own seed or you're buying, if you're getting seed from somebody who's saving it themselves, um, there's different ways and we won't go into the details of that today, um, but there are, are methods you can look up online um, to actually disinfest those seeds. So uh, for like tomato, there's certain bacterial pathogens you just absolutely do not want to get spread from seed to seed. Um, so I would look into some of those disinfestation protocols if you're into saving seeds. Um, and then again, you know, I always think it's, a, it's always a good practice to grow your own transplants um, or save your own seed for that matter, because it gives you the ability to control your own propagation material, uh, which at the end of the day, if you're, anytime you're bringing plants and soil onto your farm, you're putting yourself at risk of bringing in pathogens, weed seeds, spores, all that kind of stuff. So growing your own transplants is definitely helpful uh, from a disease management practice in that way. Now, one of the primary things we want to do, especially on an organic farm, is to put together a good crop rotation that's going to help reduce the chance of soil-borne diseases. And it's generally soil-borne diseases that we're really working against when we talk about crop rotation. Um, any of the pathogens that spread around through, through the air, through wind, like uh, leaf blights and things like that, um, it's, a, it's more difficult to control them with crop rotation. Uh, but soil-borne pathogens certainly can be, and there's you know, lots of research to back that up. Now, one of the most important parts of a successful crop rotation uh, is that we're actually rotating across plant families, not individual plant species. So, you know, oftentimes the, same, the pathogen that attacks eggplant also attacks peppers and tomatoes because they're all within the solanaceous family. So you want to make sure that you're rotating entire plant families uh, not just individual crops. Now, one of the challenges for a, a market farm is like trying to make that work economically, right? And we've done a fair amount of work uh, and with, with Tom as well, um, trying to help <clears throat> develop some information related to economics of high tunnels and how we can start to put together some successful crop rotations and high tunnels in particular. Um, as many of y'all know, for most people, a high tunnel is the most valuable real estate uh, on the farm. So you know, people that are growing in high tunnels want to grow very high value crops in order to you know, get that money back that they um, were investing initially. Sorry, I don't know why it says spinach is $45 a pound. I just noticed that. That must be a typo in there. So um, one of the things that we've done is we've actually taken a lot of our data from many of our high tunnel trials uh, and try to put together, you know, potentially a six year crop rotation and, and use that economic data with, you know, estimates of market prices or value of some of these crops to actually determine, you know, whether what kind of crop rotation you can put together with a high tunnel system. And I think you can utilize the same approach in the open field as well, um, but make sure you're thinking about that crop rotation is your, your sustenance, right? For your revenue, um, whenever you start designing your farm, because if you have a farm that's relying on only one crop, then it's not gonna last for very long. Uh, sanitation is super important for disease management and, and Mark talked about it for insect management, um, but it's just also critical as well for managing uh, plant pathogens too. Uh, so you guys saw this picture earlier. You know, one of the things to keep in mind is uh, Botrytis scenaria is a, a, fun, a fungal plant pathogen um, that actually loves to eat brown tissue. <laughs> so any of this dead tissue in these, these tunnels or out in the field uh, provide really fuel for disease epidemics for Botrytis. So in this case, one of the reasons that we, we want to keep this tunnel really clean is to help reduce uh, those, that inoculum level and, and again that food source uh, for botrytis, um, because this is a really uh, problematic disease, especially in high tunnels and greenhouses. Here you can see it on strawberries. We oftentimes call it gray mold, uh, but it will also cause fruit issues on, on tomatoes too. And 
that's one of those pathogens that actually has a very wide host range and attacks almost everything. So sanitation is one of the best ways to manage botrytis. We also utilize raised beds a lot in order to facilitate better drainage. And I think most of y'all are familiar um, with you know, that concept. Um, one of the things we have at the research station is this cool thing called a dingo that we, we've actually got a bed shaper on. So we use that within our high tunnels and it's short and you can actually run it within the tunnel rather than having it attached to a tractor. Um, here's what those raised beds look like. This is a strawberry trial that we had a few years back. Uh, we actually have the strawberry trial again this year. You can also build a similar raised bed uh, with a BCS rotary plow. Um, and uh, and that's, that's actually what this is here. Um, and then some of the larger farmers and especially in the open field might utilize, this is called a bed shaper and it, and it hooks up behind the tractor and it will make a raised bed, put down plastic and, and drip tape. Um, now you don't necessarily have to use the plastic. So I included a picture here. This is, uh, this is actually out at Mark's farm. Um, we, uh, we got the bed shaper out there and basically made raised beds for his blueberries um, that he wasn't planning to use plastic for. I think he's got wood mulch on them now. Um, but you know, blueberries have really a lot of problems with root rotting pathogens and, and some root diseases. And so they like to be raised up on berms like that. And so, you know, you can also think about using some of these raised bed techniques for perennial crops as well too. So one of the reasons that we like to use raised beds is to manage root rotters. And especially uh, in the world of strawberries um, and fruit for that matter, uh, oftentimes those perennial crops are really susceptible to pythiums, fusariums, rhizoctonias uh, that cause uh, these root rotting diseases. <clears throat> uh, water is also really important. Uh, keep in mind that this pond is oftentimes an actual source of inoculum for pathogens. So. Uh, there's a disease that's caused by a pathogen named, known as Phytophthora capsici, and it, it will actually live in irrigation ponds, and then when you irrigate it, will actually inoculate your plants for you. So that's really smart of that pathogen. Um, and there are actually places where you can do tests to find out if your pond is uh, contaminated with Phytophthora. You actually, you use a pear, and you throw a pear out in the pond, uh, and then you send the pear into the clinic, and the clinic will see if they can isolate Phytophthora off of it. Uh, so Phytophthora is actually uh, not a true fungi. It's its, its own um, kind of beast in that way. But one of the common things across all the Phytophthora species is they have these mobile zoospores. So they will, they will actually swim through the water and seek out the roots of the plants and, and oftentimes cause diseases. And so standing water is oftentimes, you know, really diagnostic um, when you start seeing issues with Phytophthora. It's amazing in this field, you can see this is just a low spot right here, right? And so that water, you know, you had probably some contaminated soil, they had a low spot that flooded for three or four days, uh, and it woke all those zoospores up and they all swam to the roots of the peppers. And one of the problems with that disease is it will actually um, oftentimes cause a crown rot, but then will actually blow up and sporulate and cause a blight of the plants too. So that becomes a real issue. So irrigation becomes really important when we think about managing plants and managing diseases. And you know, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that drip irrigation is by far, for sure, your best friend uh, when it comes to managing diseases. Because if we can keep the, the plant leaves dry, then you, you generally won 90% of the battle. And not against every pathogen, but most of them. Um, so good example of that, this is some, some data that I had on gray leaf spot, which is a pathogen that's pretty prevalent around this, this part of the country. And it's caused by a, a group of fungi, uh, septoria species um, on tomato. And so we basically were able to document that just by the sheer fact that the leaves are dry inside the high tunnel, excuse me, this is the high tunnel here, um, you know, that pathogen still blows in you see a tiny bit of damage on the leaves, but when it but it's never able to go through the sporulation process and cause an epidemic um, because it doesn't rain inside of the high tunnel. So, you know, overhead irrigation in general uh, leads to disease outbreaks, although I know it's oftentimes beneficial for other things. <clears throat> uh, compost is something that people utilize a lot for managing diseases. Um, and, you know, it can be really helpful. The idea would be that 
this compost here in this bucket of this tractor is a nice inoculum source uh, for some of those beneficial bacteria and fungi. Um, and that's been, you know, fairly well documented that you can do that uh, and have fairly good success, especially against some of those generalist root rotting pathogens, uh, et cetera. A long time ago, we did some research where we would actually spike compost with tarzanium, uh, trichoderma harzanium, excuse me, uh, which is a specific pathogenic, sorry, it, 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 is, it causes, it is a pathogen of other fungi. And so this is a biological control product. And one of the things that we found with that research is that when you spike uh, that compost with that path, with that beneficial fungi, is that it's way more successful and it's able to survive um, in the soil better. And so if you are interested in using some of these beneficial fungi that are out there, I'd really look into using compost as a way to help conserve uh, those species within the soil too. Uh, oftentimes we, we like to utilize mulching. You know, anytime you can keep the splash, uh, the rain splash from coming up, that can be helpful. Um, now I will say it's not gonna totally eliminate diseases. And when you, when you look at some of these plants that are this close to the ground, um, whether it's growing on plastic or leaves or bare soil, uh, oftentimes you can still have issues with diseases. So, you know, the mulching practices are probably more related to your weed management um, than disease management. <clears throat> Exclusion can be useful, especially in the greenhouse if you're trying to protect from um, uh, viruses. Uh, and we've, we've done some research with that looking at tomato spotted wilt virus in the high tunnel um, because oftentimes the, 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 in this case, the thrips that infect the plants um, don't, don't cause as much disease. Um, and I apologize, we're getting short on time. If it's okay with you guys, I'm just gonna go for a couple of minutes and, and finish up here. I've, we're just running a little bit behind today. Uh, soil solarization is another good management practice you can use for soil-borne plant pathogens. Uh, and the idea would be that, you know, similar to like tarping uh, and oculation that was talked about earlier with weed management, uh, you can basically get that thermal in inactivation of soil-borne plant pathogen spores um, but again, it, it can help with weeds too. So, um, you know, a lot of these practices work together. Um, a while back, we did some solarization studies uh, in high tunnels and actually found that you can get uh, soil in a high tunnel really warm um, if you use solarization. So we were, you know, basically getting that um, soil above 110 degrees and inside the, the air temperature of that high tunnel was almost 150 degrees. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but biofumigation is something that you may have an interest in looking more into. Uh, and I'm not really an expert in this. I, I have a couple of colleagues across the country that are working in the world of biofumigation. Uh, but in the basic idea is that you would utilize typically brassica cover crops um, and, and to you would actually shred them up and incorporate them into the soil and then use a plastic or some type of tarp uh, to hold that gas in as it degrades. And as, that, as those brassicas decompose, they, um, they release a, a compound called glucosinolates, uh, which will actually help to um, inactivate weed seeds and also pathogen spores. So there's a fair bit of research being done on this. This is still a fairly new practice, um, but some people are having good luck with it. Uh, we do a lot of work in our lab with the use of grafted plants too, where we actually graft uh, tomatoes with interspecific hybrid rootstock. And oftentimes these rootstocks are more resistant to certain soil-borne diseases. So th again, there's lots of info uh, on the internet about this if you have an interest. And we also produce uh, grafted plants at the research station too, if you have any interest in that as well. Let's see. Uh, and then if you start looking around on the internet, one of the things you're going to find is that there are a lot of sort of organic therapeutic practices out there. So these are sprays, these are probiotics, these are, you know, products that are, are developed to help reduce disease or help increase the vigor of plants that oftentimes they don't give you very much information about them or how they work. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that I, you know, as a, a plant biologist, I always try and keep in mind um, is that, you know, oftentimes these mechanisms work in nature, but they become very difficult to simulate uh, 
um, in commercial products like this one you see in front of you. This was actually something I think I remember. I, I Googled beneficial microbes and I came up with this picture of a jar of actual beneficial microbes, which I thought was just hilarious because, you know, uh, one microbe is not beneficial for everything. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so, you know, I think it's important to, to recognize that there's a lot of potential in these products, but be a little bit skeptical about some of them out there because there are a lot of snake oils um, in the world of organic therapeutics and some of these probiotics. Um, but there's also a lot of good examples where many of these microbes can be really beneficial um, to that ecosystem. So, but it's oftentimes very difficult to formulate them and enter them into a commercial marketplace. And so my approach is generally to utilize compost, do everything you can to diversify that microbial community and conserve the ones that you have. Um, and maybe if there's you know, one out there that, that works well, you can use it, but I wouldn't go scouring the internet for all these different beneficial microbes that you can utilize because um, it's very difficult for them to survive in the environment if they're not used to it. Okay, so to kind of wrap things up, um, some good gardening practices or IPM techniques for managing uh, especially diseases. Um, you know, we want to create a healthy soil, and I think everybody knows that how important that is, but um, just encouraging that microbial diversity and that activity within the soil by the use of cover crops and other organic uh, matter additions that you can utilize. Um, we want to utilize resistant varieties. This is one of our best tools in, as an organic farmer. Um, is to find varieties that are resistant to particular pathogens or diseases um, and try and, and utilize those. So it's important to keep up with, with some of the, you know, the recent advances uh, with, from the seed companies and the, the breeding efforts that are out there. You should always have healthy transplants or seeds. Um, and, you know, this, is, this becomes really important, again, especially with vegetatively propagated crops um, where viruses can become problematic within plant populations. Um, but but it's, it's important to not be cheap on the, the plant purchasing and the seed purchasing because, you know, that, that can be so important as to making sure that you have um, seeds that are free of pathogens. Uh, weeds obviously can be a problem. Uh, sanitation is just incredibly important. And I think especially, you know, in, in organic systems, uh, sanitation is really critical because it's, it's really one of your best methods to try and keep not only diseases, but especially insects out of the, out of the crop, uh, and crop rotation, of course. So in general, one of the things that we wanna do is you know, move our, our farming system from a place that has low biodiversity and low ecosystem services or low ecological function, however you wanna call it, and, and move, that, you know, move that ledge to where you have multiple crops over time and space to foster high biodiversity. Um, because this is one of the ways it's gonna help, you know, reduce the chances of uh, disease epidemics and, you know, not only diseases, but also pests as well uh, too. So, you know, being knowledgeable about um, how to do that is gonna be really important to, to being successful. <clears throat> 